And the conversation that I think is appropriate for us to have this morning is not between you and me or, or between us. I think the, the appropriate conversation we need to have this morning is between us and God. Now, I don't believe that God is up in heaven waiting for us to, uh, just sitting there waiting for us to, uh, uh, answer, or to answer some social hotline, waiting to just pick up the phone when we call. Um, I think God has uh, been on that line ever since we last had our last words with him. I think he's been holding on to that line, waiting for us to pick up the phone on our end and to have another conversation with him. And the way in, in, in our Christian faith, the way that we have um, a conversation with God, whether it's an intimate conversation, whether it's a, a conversation out of front frustration or whether it's uh, anger or whether it's uh, pleasantries or whatever, we call that prayer. And prayer is the vessel that does that. But I've discovered through the years that a lot of people sometimes get a little confused about prayer. Uh, sometimes people actually um, misunderstand what, what prayer is or, or they misunderstand what, what prayer is for. And many think that, that prayer has to be something formal, that, that we have to have just the right words to share. And in fact, uh, Paul even says in, in his writings, he says, in those moments when we don't even know what we're going to say or how to say it, that the Spirit will groan on our behalf. So God um, sometimes places those words words in our mouth uh, when we come to a time of prayer. But I think it's really important today that as we talk about prayer, that we come to a great basic understanding. And prayer is simply having a conversation with God. Um, I heard a story about a, a, a man who um, uh, attended a downtown city church. And every day, uh, he worked not far from his church. And every day, he would walk to his church. At 5 o'clock, uh, when he got off of work, he'd walk to his church. And he would go inside, and he would spend 45 minutes inside that church. He would do that every day. And there was a construction project. You know how that is. Anytime he took around, there's construction going on. There was a construction project that was going on nearby. And, and the construction workers started taking note that precisely at 5 o'clock every day, this man was walking and going inside of his church. And they noted 45 minutes was the length of time he was there. So he came out one day, and one of the construction workers just had to ask, says, what in the world are you doing in there? He said, well, I'm praying. And you can imagine um, that probably brought up more questions, and it, it actually did. And, and one of those questions is, well, what does that mean? And another question became, well, how do you do that? And the last question was, what do you expect when you pray? And the man said, it's quite simple. He said, I go into the church, I walk up to the altar, I kneel down, I fold my hands, and I quiet my heart. And he said, and after I've taken the time to just quiet my heart, he said, I begin to speak. And he said, I just say something very simply, and I just say, God, this is Harry. I'm here today. And he said, and I'll just stop and I'll just listen. And after a while, I'll feel the impressions of the Holy Spirit on my heart and God's voice in my ears. And I'll hear the Lord say, Harry, this is God. I'm here with you today. And I just pour out my heart, he said. And I pour out my heart to God. And we have this wonderful conversation that goes on. And in that midst of that conversation, we share a lot of things. But more importantly, I understand what it means to be in a deep abiding relationship with my heavenly father. Now, see, you and I, we, we can have that too. And, and sometimes we think that having a, a solid prayer life is just too hard. We, we find out that we're stressed with time. We, we feel like we're inadequate with our words. We feel like we're just not smart enough to know what is it that God would like to talk about today. But, but specifically, God invites us every day to set aside some specific time to be alone with him and to have that conversation. And the thing that we have to remember is that our prayers need to be a two-way street. That when we pray, it should not always just be uh, filled up with us just conversing with God and chitty-chatting with him all day and just telling him everything that's on our mind and all the things and problems that we're going through. But we need to also to learn to listen. In fact, um, one of the greatest prayers that I learned in my uh, adult life later on as I became a pastor was, when I'm going through some really tough times, the prayer that, that, that yearns in my heart is, Lord, what is it that you're teaching me through this situation? A well-known saying is that prayer changes things. Maybe you've seen that. I have that on a little placard in my office. And, and I want to um, up that up a little bit, and I want to modify it. Yes, prayer changes things. But I think there's another level to this, and I think that prayer changes people. And I think that as prayer changes people, then people change things. And I say, truly believe that, that prayer, the responsible part of what prayer is in our conversation with God, is that we become molded and become the spirit of the person that he's created us to be. And in the midst of that, we begin to hear and learn the plans that God has for us. 
But you know, when we begin to pray and when we begin to have those conversations with God, there comes a warning. And that warning is, be very careful what you pray for. David, the great king, learned this. And he writes in Psalm 139, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, know my thoughts. Point out everything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now, I want you to think about those words of the psalm that David spoke, you know, to test, to seek, to point out everything that offends. And, and I, you know, I really think it begs the question, when we think about those kinds of things, do any of us really want to be searched by God? In fact, I, I'd beg the question to ask in this other point is, you know, what David was saying was, David was saying, God, test me. David was saying, look into my heart. David was saying and crying out, if there's any fault in me, anything at all, Lord, please point it out to me. Point out anything that offends you. And I can tell you that that kind of prayer can be very dangerous. I mean, how many of us um, go to those that we love, like our husbands and our wives or our best friends? How many of us look them in the eye and say, please point out to me everything about me that offends, that offends me, offends you about me. Tell me all of my faults. How many of us do that? None of us do that. And so this is the kind of prayer that is so important that as we get close to God, that David says to open ourselves, to open our hearts that we need to be open in what God is knowing about us. And here's the key point. God already knows everything about us. So there's no reason to try to hide whatever it is that's in our heart. It's kind of like um, uh, when we ask God to search us, it's like going through an airport uh, x-ray machine. You know, you go through the x-ray machine, the TSA screeners, they x-ray your bags. They see everything that's in your bags. Just as we come before God in prayer, God sees everything, everything at all that's about our heart and who we are. And when we, like David, come before God like this x-ray machine, we need to say, God, examine me, x-ray me, look me through and through, find whatever faults are inside of me, whatever those may be. If I have faults with people, if people have faults with me, if I have faults with whatever it is, if I have sinned, if I am not living up to the life that you've created me to live, Lord, search and seek and, and point those things out to me that I can become the better person. And with that prayer, David says, we must also say, Lord, we will listen to what you have to say. And we will abide by those words. You see, prayer is talking and listening, isn't it? But let me, let me tell you a couple things that prayer is not. First of all, uh, prayer is not a religious activity. It's not something that we do um, to, to, for the sake of just doing it. Prayer is not something that we do just to bring onus or the spotlight on ourselves. In fact, we, we learn in Matthew 6, 5, Jesus said when you pray that you should do it in quiet, that you should not make a spectacle of yourself. Uh, the reason why Jesus spoke out against that was that all the religious leaders at that time, basically they were doing everything in their power to make sure that all of the peasants and all the Gentiles and all of the people who were of lower class would see how pious that they were. That if people saw them praying in public, they would think, wow, that is a really religious person. But deep down, Jesus knew that the prayers of those individuals at that particular time were not prayers for God's kingdom's purpose. Were not prayers for the fulfillment of the kingdom's purpose. But those prayers that were being uttered at that moment when Jesus said those words were self-centered prayers. And so a lot comes from that. And, and so they were praying as a ritual. They would go in public and they would do that. They would pray as a ritual. Now, there are some ritualistic prayers, aren't there? When we have a meal, it's probably ritual that, like me, you sit down and you have a prayer to, to thank God for the blessings of the gifts that you've received that you're about to partake in, in eating. There's also rituals in, in prayer when we go to meetings and, and all of a sudden heads will be bowed and, and, and someone will invite a prayer in order to gather people as comes. But, but prayer is not supposed to be a religious activity. It's supposed to be that one-to-one -one connection, that intimate connection that we have with our Heavenly Father. And in that intimate connection, we begin to see who God is. You see, we can share everything with God, things that, that we can't share with everyone else. And the point about that is, is that he already knows it. And as I said earlier, we shouldn't, we shouldn't feel like we need to hide anything. So if, you have, if you're afraid of approaching God, if you're afraid of, of um, as David said, you know, bearing your soul and your spirit to the Father, uh, the Lord says, do that. And with that, David says that there is a cleansing that will come and the burdens will be unborn at that particular point. 
So if, if prayer is not a ritual, then you might be wondering, well, then why are we supposed to pray? And, and, and what's the purpose of that? Uh, the thing is, is not what we say, and it's not how we say it, but it's the fact that we are connecting with God in an intimate conversation. That's the purpose of prayer. That's the importance of prayer. And as we begin to, to um, connect with God, it's like, a, it's like a tree being planted near a body of water, that the more that those roots are watered, the deeper that they go, and the stronger that tree becomes. So it is with our souls. So it is with our character and all. Ian Bounds says that prayer is the language of a man who is burdened with a sense of need. And certainly as we feel those burdens in our hearts, that intimate conversation that we open with God will bring uh, transformation in the things that which we seek. If we want to become more like Jesus, if we want to become more filled with patience and kindness and, and uh, love and grace and peace and all of those things, then we need to make sure that we're spending more time with him. And the way we do that is through prayer. We do that and as we pray, God pours into us and we pour also into our relationship with him. Here's a second thing that prayer is not, and this is one that, that a lot of people sometimes get caught up into, and, and prayer is not magic. Um, it's, it's, if you pray for something, it's not automatically gonna happen. Um, if, if a congregation our size, uh, it's, it's clear to understand that many of us would raise our hand and feel like at some point in time in our life that our prayer was not answered the way in which we want. In fact, I would be willing to bet that all of us could say at some point in time, something that we prayed about didn't happen exactly the way in which we had asked. So we understand that, that prayer is not magic. It's not that if we do it, that something automatically is going to happen. In Acts chapter 8, we learn the story of a man called Simon the Sorcerer. And Simon was a man who um, had built his entire life on sorcery and making things mysteriously and mystically appear and disappear and bringing favor upon people and, and, and showering them with gifts and things that they asked him to do. And he was doing all this through magic. Um, in, in verses 9 and 10, the Samaritan people had come to a point where they saw uh, Simon the sorcerer as uh, kind of a, of, of a demagogue. And, and they called him the great one, the power of God. And we see in that uh, relationship that, that some falsities were being brought forward. Well, Philip, one of the disciples, preached a great sermon, and Simon the sorcerer happened to hear it that day. And the scripture says in Acts that Simon was so moved by the words and the truth of what he heard that he asked Philip to baptize him. And Simon was baptized. Now, you would think that he would have gotten it then, but he didn't. Because then all of a sudden, Simon sees Peter and John laying hands and invoking the Holy Spirit into the lives of the new believers. And Simon went and began to pull out his treasury saying, I'd like to purchase that gift as well. And Peter excoriated Simon and said, this is not at all what this is about. And Peter writes, in, in, or Luke writes about Peter in, in Acts 8, may your money perish with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this. For your heart is not right before God. Turn from your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitterness and held captive by sin. You see, some people think um, if you just pray a certain way, they think if you just pray hard enough, they, they think that if you say, but I believe that this is going to happen, that all of a sudden magically it's going to happen. But let me tell you, that doesn't work that way. In fact, we find out that, that God is not a puppet on a string and he's not a bellhop. He's not somebody that we can tell to go do this or that or to make this happen or that happen. God is God and he's sovereign. And God enacts the way in which he enacts. I want you to uh, consider an analogy this morning. Um, we discovered a, a place that I'm not allowed to go to anymore. Uh, when we were on vacation, Patty said, we're not allowed to go here anymore. It's a, it's a, a retro candy store on Gulf Boulevard. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> but let me tell you what, uh, I hit the mother load when I found that place. And I was just like a little kid, and we went inside, and, and there were things back. You remember those little uh, wax Coca-Cola bottles you'd bite off? And you, yeah, you remember that? And, and the lips with the teeth in it, there were wax and all that stuff. And, I mean, the hard candy and all those things. Folks, it has a... Um, 30 pound um, gummy bear uh, snake in there that you can eat for $80. I mean, don't buy it, it's too much money. But anyway, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a unique candy store. And we went in there and I was just, 
like a little kid. I was going from place to place, looking at this, looking at that, going all over the place. And, and, and I began to start filling up the little basket they give you with, oh, here's this, and here's this, and nerds, and this, and that, and all the zots and all these kind of things that I had as a kid trying to remember all that. And my wife, Patty, put the brakes on that. Can you imagine that? And, and you know, Pat, Pat, from Patty's viewpoint, she knows that that stuff's not good for you. Now, I'm kind of blind at times to that, but, but she knows from her viewpoint that that's just not good for you. And she knows from past experience that, that if she allowed that to happen, that I would have probably eaten a majority of that store that night. And uh, not only would my teeth have fallen out, but I probably would have had a blood sugar problem after that. So uh, what I'm seeing is my wife sees from a different vantage. She sees from a different point of view. She sees it outside of my wants and desires or the thing that attracted me. And she sees it from a greater sense of experience and wisdom. And that's the point I'm trying to draw with God with this analogy. Sometimes when we pray and we say that that's exactly what I need, I have to have it or it has to work out exactly this way, or one of my favorite prayers that I hear people say, God, change that person versus change me, you know, kind of thing. You know, what we find out is that it, God chooses not to answer every prayer that we pray because he knows that if every prayer was answered exactly the way that we asked, it would change the dynamics of the people that we are. Now, I know that might be a little hard to understand for a minute, but think about it. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to own Hawaii. And when I was a kid, I prayed, God, give me Hawaii. Now, was that a stupid prayer or what? It was a misguided prayer. But, but God did not award me Hawaii, obviously, because he knew that that was not something that would glorify his kingdom or to bring glory to him. So the Bible also tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that all the promises that God has ever made have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So if you've ever wondered, does God fulfill his promises when I pray? Absolutely. How did he do it? Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we see the significance of that. But, but when Paul writes those words, that the promises that God made have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ, we need to add an amen at the end of that. And the reason we need to add an amen to the end of that is that the amen means so be it. We need to come to that understanding that all of God's promises for us have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And that's the significance. Prayer is just not supposed to be a litany of things that we want, but it's to be an action where we partner with God for the purposes of his kingdom. When Jesus came into the world, what were his words? The kingdom of God is at hand. So we are to partner through prayer for the purposes of God's kingdom. And in prayer, we partner with God and God partners with us in return. And here's something that I've learned, that, that as we partner with God in prayer, we begin to understand a little bit more when things don't work out the way that we had asked, why they may not have. When we become more intimate in our relationship with God, the things that we're most fearful of aren't so scary anymore. When we bathe our lives in prayer and have a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father, and when we begin to understand the will of God and the love of God in our life and in our families and in our workforces and in our church and in our communities in the world, we begin to see a different perspective of what it means to bring the kingdom's focus here on earth. Take a look at Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel, the great prophet, described what he uh, prophetically saw as a temple. And he told the people, he said, I want you to see a temple. Now, back in those days, remember, temple worship was the center of the Hebrew community. The temple had been devastated. The people had been taken off into captivity. And Ezekiel said, I want you to see a temple because I see God giving us a temple. And what he was doing was he was giving words of hope and encouragement to the people. He was saying to them, soon the time will come when you will no longer be held in bondage and in captivity and wandering in the wilderness that God will deliver to you, to all of us, the promise of the land in which he has given to us. And Ezekiel said that the temple has a river flowing. And in that river, uh, the river had great strength and depth. But if you read Ezekiel 47 and you read about the temple that he's describing, this river that he's talking about is unlike any other river you'll know. This river flowed uphill. Now think about that. How many of you have ever seen a river that flows uphill? 
You probably haven't. And what he was talking about here was, he said it flowed uphill through the desert and, and the river's coming um, out of the temple. It's coming out of the church. It's flowing uphill. It's going against the grain of what everybody else can expect. And listen closely to me. Imagine that river flowing uphill against any expectation or thought that you might have. It's bizarre, but it brings a point because it begs the question, why are we surprised then that walking closely to God, talking closely to God, listening to God, why are we surprised that that, that also causes us to go uphill? That we're not going down low, but that we're going uphill in the midst of that. Here's some quick examples, I think, that will hit, hit this point home. Esther. Esther. There's a book in the Bible. Uh, read it. It's about Esther, how God's people were saved through the bravery of this woman who was, who was a queen. And she went against the norms of society. Esther, the law of the land at that particular time said that you could not stand before the king or even ask the king a question unless the king personally invited you. Well, the Jewish people were about ready to get snuffed out, and Esther went against the grain. She, swam, she went like a river upstream, uphill. And she stood before the king and she begged and pleaded and pointed out some of the sins that were happening, of the traps that were happening to God's people. And the king realized what was going on. And because Esther chose to be a river flowing upstream, the Hebrew people were saved. Stephen was an early Christian, one of the early disciples, probably the first leader of the church, of the local church ever elected as he comes out one day and he's being pelted with stones and he's dying, Stephen refuses to back down in what he believes. You know, about 500 years ago, there was a, a Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther had, had it fed up with all that the Catholic Church was doing at that time, paying out or charging indulgences to the people. If you wanted a blessing from the church, you'd have to give them land. If you wanted to uh, come to the communion line, you'd have to give them expensive art and gold. And it was all about indulgences. And Luther said, enough is enough is enough. And he had the courage to stand before the Pope. And he had the courage to stand before King Charles V. And he had the courage to say, enough is enough. We need to stop this. You see, sometimes... Our life of prayer is like this temple, this river that's flowing uphill. And there might be times in your life where God might call you to flow uphill, where God might call you to go against the grain of what's happening around you. There might be times where God says that you need to be a river flowing and pouring into the life of a friend or a peer and to change their perspective so that they can see a greater good. Maybe God is saying to you through prayer today that you're exactly where he wants you to be. And he wants you to keep in focus all of which he has planned for you. Let me leave you with three questions this morning I think are so important when it comes to prayer. And here's the first one. Do I really believe that God wants to have a conversation with me? Folks, you bet he does. Like I said earlier, he's never hung up the phone. He's still connected. The question is, when are we going to reconnect? Here's the second question. What would life be like if I talked to God the way that I talked to my closest friend? Now, I'm not belittling the power of God. I'm not trying to belittle the majesty of God. Don't misunderstand my point here. But what I'm trying to do is, is create a pathway for you to understand that you don't have to be afraid to approach God. You don't have to worry about approaching God. Folks, we're all sinners. None of us are worthy to approach the throne. But Peter and John and all the apostles remind us, and even all the writings of the Bible, that we can approach his throne of grace. And from that, something will magically or mystically happen, majestically happen for us in the midst of in his presence. And here's the third question. What would be the best time of day for you to dedicate time for prayer? You know, it's funny, um, I've, looked, I've looked through my own calendar and I've, um, I came to some conclusions over my own vacation that uh, probably I got a little sloppy in some daily uh, disciplines of my own devotional life while I was away, uh, spent too much time resting up and uh, probably more idle than I should have been. And, and so I, I'm coming clean with that and I realized that it's so important to spend time with God. The only way that we're gonna know our Lord is to spend time with him. 
And as you look at your calendar, as I call myself to look at mine, look at where you're spending your time. How much time are you driving errands in the car? How much time are you on the golf course? How much time are you spending at your desk at work, in the grocery store? Whatever it is that you're doing, how about transitioning and uh, transitioning some of that time back to God and being a part of him again in your life? So connecting through God to God brings, uh, through prayer, is that connection. It's that staying power that brings that strength and power of that uphill flowing, flowing river. It means that God, uh, we have God's ear. It means that we have access to God's heart. It means that God's always patient with us. He's ready to, to be there for us at, at a moment's notice. And he's willing to always give a word of encouragement and direction. But most importantly, the only way this is going to happen is if you and I choose to connect in prayer. Let's pray.